You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Hello, and welcome to episode 355 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. On April 10, 1606, King James I of England granted the Virginia Company, which was a commercial trading company, a charter so that it could undertake the work of establishing an English colony on the eastern coast of North America. Today, we know that the Virginia Company successfully established the first permanent English colony in North America at Jamestown, Virginia. But what work did the Virginia Company have to do to establish this colony? And how much money did the company have to raise, and from whom did it raise this money to support its colonial venture? Misha Ewan, a lecturer at the University of Bristol and a historian of early modern England and its Atlantic world empire, joins us to discuss the creation and operation of the Virginia Company with details from her book, The Virginia Venture, American Colonization and English Society, 1580 to 1660. Now, as we investigate the Virginia Company, Misha reveals details about the Virginia Company and why England had to depend on trading companies like it to launch its programs of colonization. The plans and work the Virginia Company had to undertake to ensure it could establish a viable colony, and information about the Virginia Company's investors and why they may have chosen to support the company and England's colonial ambitions. But first, April is Adopt-A-Listener Month. It's a month where we try to get more friends and family to listen to a podcast. So if you know someone who loves history but hasn't yet tried Ben Franklin's World or any podcasts, April is a great month to try and convince that person to finally listen to a podcast. So thank you for adopting a listener this month, and thank you for all the work you do to help spread the word about Ben Franklin's World. The team and I really appreciate your help, and you've really expanded the audience for this show. So thank you very much. Okay, are you ready to venture behind the scenes of the Virginia Venture? Let's go meet our guest historian. Joining us is a historian of early modern England and its empire in the Atlantic world. She's held fellowships from Yale University, the Huntington Library, and the Folger Shakespeare Library. Presently, She's a lecturer in early modern history at the University of Bristol, and she joins us today to discuss the creation and operation of the Virginia Company with details from her book, The Virginia Venture, American Colonization and English Society, 1580 to 1660. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Misha Ewan. Thank you for having me. When we talk about the history of English and later British colonization in North America and the Caribbean, we're talking about a history that began in the late 16th century. Misha, what was the English and later British Empire like during the late 1500s and early 1600s? Could you help us get a better feel for England and its colonial claims during this pretty early period? So there was no empire to speak of in this period, as we would later understand it. But there are attempts to establish permanent settlements in North America. Under Queen Elizabeth, she grants status patents to colonists to go and explore the east coast of North America. And in the 1580s, they established the Roanoke colony, which obviously fails. But during this period, there's also attempts at colonization in Ireland. And in fact, many of the men who have experience of colonization in Ireland later go and settle in North America. But there are other more informal attempts at overseas trade and colonization as we might think of it. There are trading companies trading in places as far apart as Russia and the East Indies and establishing trading factories in places like India. So there are these various different projects going on, but there is no permanent colony or settlement in the late 16th century, and it would be several more years before they're successful under the following reign of James I in the early 17th century. What was the draw of colonization for England? Why was England interested in establishing permanent colonies in places like North America? England was quite a small actor on the world stage. It's a Protestant nation, and I think they feel threatened by 
Spanish influence and establishing a foothold in North America would give them a way both to have access to their own natural resources and trade and not have to rely on other European powers, but also try to assert their own influence with what they see, this growing Spanish Catholic influence, not only in Europe, but now also in the so-called New World. So that's one of the reasons. But there are all these other cultural and economic and social reasons as well. In England at this time, there are concerns about underemployment and overpopulation. And increasingly, they see colonisation as an outlet for some of these concerns. They think it will provide new jobs and opportunities, not only for the poor labouring classes, but also for the second sons of the gentries who are in search of their own opportunities for social advancement and wealth. So there are a mixture of different factors, but I think clearly they are being influenced by their European neighbours as well and looking to them and following their precedents. And I think that is one of the key reasons that increasingly North America and the Americas more generally seems like the best option for them. They think it's a land of plenty. They think it is rich in natural resources. And importantly, when they're looking to the east coast of North America in particular, that's an area that isn't yet claimed by another European nation. So it seems for the English that it's just there waiting for them and very much open. Now, wanting to establish a colony to enrich yourself with natural resources and any precious metals that your colonists might recover from the land is one thing, but actually establishing a colony is quite another. And it would take a lot of money for all the European governments and empires that wanted to establish a colony in the Americas to be able to establish one. So Misho, what is England's plan here? Would you tell us a bit about England's plan to finance a venture so that they could establish a permanent colony? So you're right that colonization does require very deep pockets. And Queen Elizabeth and then King James after her do not have the capital to finance this. So instead, would-be English colonists in the 16th century and the early 17th centuries, they do seek crown approval and they're granted crown permission. And this is in the form of these letters, patents and these charters for trading companies. But what they really rely on is the capital of the nobility in England and the merchant population as well. And they're seeking this private investment through their own networks, much wider networks. So beyond the court, into merchant communities in the city of London, but also places like Plymouth and Bristol. So in this way, again, England is different from Spain. The Spanish state is incredibly wealthy at this time because of their expanding empire. And England just doesn't have the same resources to draw upon. And this is one of the reasons that we do have the development of these private trading companies in this period, because they need private wealth in order to fund these ventures. Speaking of the Crown's reliance on private investors to establish colonial settlements, Misha's book, The Virginia Venture, charts the creation and work of the Virginia Company to establish English colonies in North America. Misha, would you tell us how England worked to get merchants and investors excited about investing in a colonial venture and why these investors established a company to try and accomplish the state's goal of establishing a colony? So there is this ongoing contrast, I guess, between sort of crown influence and the creation of these private companies. And the Virginia Company is a joint stock company. This is a model which essentially is how we'd understand companies today with different shareholders. So although it's a smaller group of gentlemen who petitioned the crown for a charter to establish the Virginia Company, and they're granted this charter by James I in 1606, the company itself is made up of a much greater number of individuals who invest. So it gets its start in 1606. And originally it is a smaller council of company directors and they're directing colonization from England. And there is also a council in Virginia. But a few years later in 1609, they kind of realize that this model isn't really working for them. And the company opens up. They provide opportunities for a much broader public to invest in the company. So you have people from merchant backgrounds, people who are in trades, and we also have first women investing in the company as well. And what this model provides, it spreads the risk amongst many individuals. There's not one single person or it's not the crown who is sharing not only the financial risk, but you know the political and diplomatic risk as well. 
And this is appealing to people in England because they can invest £12 in a share. But if things go wrong, it is only £12. They're not pouring in hundreds and hundreds of pounds as investors do in the East India Company, for example, which is quite an expensive company to invest in. And they spread this risk amongst themselves. So you have people who invest in groups, sometimes with colleagues or neighbours or other members of their family. Your description of the Virginia Company, at least the company as it was structured in 1609, after it decided to allow more people to participate, your description of the Virginia Company seems to reveal how the company really transformed the scope of England's national campaign to establish colonies in North America. I think we can see how English men and women living in this early 17th century might have seen and equated an investment in the Virginia Company as an investment in England. Yeah, correct. And it's from this point onwards, really, that we see the membership of the company expand to include people from different social backgrounds and classes as well. Though that's not how they would have thought of it themselves at the time, but people who are in professions and trades, so members of livery companies, but also women from merchant backgrounds. And then the company gets a new charter in 1612. And at this point, we then see even more women coming into the company from noble backgrounds. And I think by this point, the company already has an increasingly well-oiled promotional campaign underway. They're seeking investment through the courts across the city of London and beyond, and really trying to kind of leverage the influence that they have. And they have certain patrons who are helping them to do this. King James's son, Prince Henry, and also the king's right-hand man, the influential statesman, Robert Cecil. They both die in 1612. And, you know, after that point, the company does kind of have some trouble because it's taken a few years to get the project underway. They've not been particularly successful and they've just lost two of their greatest patrons. And at that point, some people do default on their payments to the company because they're losing confidence in it and its ability to actually succeed. It's a slow progress. But I think actually by having that kind of number of investors and some people who are willing to carry on pouring capital into it, willing to lend the company money on interest or also provide charitable payments to the company as well is really what helps it keep up the momentum over the next few years until it reaches a point that it has increasing stability and seems like permanent settlement is actually going to be a prospect. I know we'd love to know more about individual investors. Before we dive into that topic, Misha, you mentioned that the Virginia Company was a joint stock company. And I wonder if you could tell us how a joint stock company works. Yeah, the benefit of that is that you can seek investment from people that don't have any prior experience of colonization and trade. And this is what is different and beneficial. So they can seek investment from people who do have money to give, but maybe have never invested in these kinds of projects before, because what they have is a small group of company directors who are experienced, who can oversee trade but they give these shareholders a say in how policy is created and they have these meetings that everyone is able to attend and and voice their opinions and voice their concerns. So in some ways, it's a more democratic way of operating a company, I guess, although that's not how they would have thought of it at the time. But it's different from regulated companies, which is the other model that the English use for other overseas trade. And those companies do rely on all of the members of the company being experienced merchants. Because the Virginia Company doesn't rely on that model, that's why you do get all of these gentlemen at court who are investing and all of these noble women. And that's important because they are able to bring that kind of cultural and social capital to the company. They make it respectable. They kind of bring their civility and their networks and their connections and patronage to the company, which is really important for its success and kind of lends it an air of respectability that, quite frankly, other trading companies in this period just don't have. They're seen as being spheres of merchants. The Virginia Company has this different feel to it for English people at the time. Was the Virginia Company the first joint stock company to operate in England, or were there other models for the Virginia Company to follow? It's not the first. The East India Company was a joint stock company, and there was also a joint stock company in the 16th century but it is the first joint stock company which is attempting colonization. In this period, the East India Company isn't looking to establish permanent colonies. Colonization comes much later. 
So as a joint stock company, which is establishing colonies, it is the first in England. And I think it's questionable how successful that was and whether it was the right model. Clearly, people in England eventually decided that that wasn't the best way to model colonization. But in 1606, there was a precedent for it. And actually, many of the people who were involved in the East India Company, which received its charter just six years before, also invested in the Virginia Company. So there's that kind of shared experience and shared practice there, sort of in the community of merchants and nobility in London who are looking both to North America and looking eastwards to India and the East Indies as well. It sounds like the Virginia Company generated a lot of excitement in England because you have this respectable organization that anyone can participate in. And its purpose was to establish the first permanent English colony in North America. And if you think about it from that 17th century perspective, that's really exciting and patriotic if you're an English person. Now, in order to actually establish a colony, you need to have plans. So Misha, what were the early plans of the Virginia Company to establish a colony? And what kind of marketing material did the company produce to encourage interest and investment from all sorts of English people? So I should caveat everything I'm going to say now with the fact that before 1618, none of the company's own records have survived. So we don't have any of the company minutes, but we can gather a lot from what's going on in the company from the printed promotional material that produces and also, you know, the kind of letters and correspondence of people who are involved. But you're right, it's trying to garner interest in lots of different ways. So they commission preachers to preach in church and spread the word about this Christian mission and the ideas that they have to convert the indigenous population to Christianity. And they're also seeking donations in church. They're also spreading the word through Parliament and the court and the inns of court as well. So within the city of London and the kind of wider London area in the palaces and the halls of Westminster, they're trying to seek sort of interest and investment and patronage. And I think also one of the ways that they're trying to kind of galvanise interest is also by bringing back colonial goods, new goods from North America, and also the peoples, the indigenous peoples of North America who bring back as captives and also guests to show the people of England that these are the opportunities that will be waiting for us there and to learn from them as well about the wealth of natural resources and what the inhabitants of North America are like and what the geography of North America is like. So there are different means and sort of ways that they're doing this. And some of this kind of evidence has survived. We can learn a lot from the different messages that they're promoting that this is both about religion and piety, but it is also about profit and trade. And I think they don't see those two things as being in conflict. In fact, they actually think that those things are harmonious and actually you should have both for successful colonization. Now, you might recall from episode 250 that The Virginia Company established the first permanent English colony in North America at Jamestown in 1607. Misha, would you tell us how Jamestown was selected by the company as the site for the first permanent English settlement in North America? And about the different work and planning that the company had to do to establish the colony at Jamestown? The men that went to Jamestown were given very clear instructions. They were to find a site that was 100 miles up a navigable river. And one of the reasons for this was that they believed that they would be able to go in search of the Northwest Passage, but they also wanted to find a site that they could easily defend against any potential Spanish attack. And I think going to the site in person, which I've done a couple of times now, really gave me a much better sense as a historian of why that place would have appealed to them. It sits on this expansive river. You can kind of see in all directions. It's wooded. They have access to water. It was rich in animal and plant life. And as far as they're aware at this point, there is a local potentially friendly indigenous population that they believe they'll be able to establish trading relationships with. And of course, this part of North America, not exactly the Chesapeake, but the Carolina Banks, That is somewhere that they have been before, they have experience of it. And even since the failed Roanoke colony, there have been other exploratory ventures to the Chesapeake. 
So there's some familiarity when they, you know, happen upon Jamestown. But I think there is also a matter of chance in these things. And I think it's interesting now to wonder whether their fortification of Jamestown, did they see that as permanent or did they think that maybe they might go in search of a site elsewhere? Because they do continue to explore the surrounding area, going to the area where Richmond is today, for instance. And although James Fort remains the centre of the Jamestown colony, by the 1620s, households and plantations have spread out into the area more widely. But it turns out that actually it's not the best site for them because the water is brackish and it makes the men very ill. And there are all sorts of other issues that they run into. That's fascinating. It sounds like the leadership of the Virginia Company had a bit of an idea of the geography of Virginia. We just heard you describe how they gave fairly specific instructions to its settlers for establishing a colony. And those specific instructions may not have had exact knowledge of Jamestown Island or the surrounding area, but enough knowledge that the colonists were able to take some discretion about how and where they would settle in the Jamestown area. Yeah. And these are men who are trained men, you know, navigators, sailors, soldiers. So I think there's a sense that they themselves will use their own experience to be able to identify the best possible place based on the instructions that they're given by the council in London. And that's what happens. Now, if we were colonists on this voyage to establish Jamestown, what kind of work would we expect to do when we arrive at Jamestown Island? What work went into establishing this first permanent English settlement? So I guess the first priority for them was to fortify. They are worried about a foreign attack, but they're also worried about protecting themselves against any potentially hostile local indigenous population as well. And I guess the second thing that they would be worried about is supplies. They would have brought supplies with them, but they would know that those supplies were going to run out at some point and they would have to think about how they were going to get food stuff. And I think looking at the group of men that were in that first group, that group of 104 men and boys who arrived at Jamestown, I think gives a sense of their ideas about what would make a successful colony. So they have labourers, men who I guess they envisaged would plant and produce food and build and fortify as well, but they have a blacksmith, they have a tailor, there's a mason, there are several carpenters, and there's a preacher as well who's there to look after the godly health of the colonists. So I think that kind of gives a sense of they did expect that once they had done those kind of basic things that they could look to expand their industry there. But trade would also be a crucial part of that, as well as producing their own colonial goods like tobacco and vines for wine and the silk industry and all these other ideas that they have that met with mixed success. Establishing a colony at Jamestown seems to have required a lot of labor. You mentioned that these initial colonists included a lot of skilled craftsmen, as well as a lot of unskilled laborers who were capable of building a fort, cutting down trees and that sort of unskilled work. Misha, did you ever get a sense that when you looked at the Virginia Company records, the records that we still have that haven't been lost to time, what costs the Virginia Company incurred to establish and keep a colony running? Again, because these earlier records are missing, we don't know exact figures. But I guess if we look at the number of investors and the amount of capital that they pour into the venture, which is in the many thousands, which is not enough, quite frankly, I think we know that this is a very expensive endeavor. And some of the earlier printed material, which does survive, shows that they are quickly realizing that they aren't sending colonists with enough food and with enough supplies because things are actually much more difficult than they anticipate. So we see them drawing up lists of a kind of ideal roster of equipment and tools that people should take with them so that they can be more self-sufficient. And this is, you know, different kinds of farming and agricultural equipment and things that you would need to build, like you say, so hammers and nails and that kind of thing. But quickly, as it dawns on the company that investor capital will not be enough, they do look to other ways to raise investment from a broader public of people in England. And that involves everything from charitable donations and one-off payments to the company and loans, but also things like the company lotteries, which actually proved to be remarkably profitable for the Virginia company. 
When we visit Jamestown and visit the National Historic Site in Historic Jamestown, we really get the impression that Jamestown is a fairly small colony. And I guess that's reflective of the Virginia Company, too, that it started out as this pretty small entity. But as soon as expenses and lives that you had to have to colonize grew, it sounds like the company gradually had to expand. So right now, we need to take a moment to thank our episode sponsor. When we get back, we'll look into the details of the Virginia Company's expansion. Do you enjoy art? If so, you should be aware that the Art Museums of Colonial Williamsburg will be opening a brand new exhibition called Eddie Arning Artist. Eddie Arning created bold and colorful pieces using wax crayons and oil pastels to feature birds, animals, and scenes from everyday life. Eddie drew many images from his memory, and he also drew inspiration from illustrations in popular magazines. Arning was born in Texas in 1898. Due to mental illness, he spent 30 years of his life in the Austin State Hospital. It was only after his discharge to a nursing home that Arning began to draw and paint. He was most active with his artwork between 1964 and 1973. The Art Museums of Colonial Williamsburg's Any Arning Artist Exhibition will open on May 6, 2023. To learn more about this exhibition and how you can come to view it, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash eddie. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash eddie, spelled E-D-D-I-E. Misha, the Virginia Company seems to have grown larger and larger as it required more and more assistance from the English public to keep the colony of Jamestown afloat with more settlers and supplies. Do we have an accurate picture of this? Did the Virginia Company's growth coincide with the colony's need for more settlers and supplies? I think they probably did not envisage the first group of 100 men would all perish as quickly as they did. Supplies of further laborers would be required, but hundreds of people go to the colony in those first few years. And that does require a huge amount of capital. And it's clear that some of that money is coming from the company, but I'm sure that some of those people were also probably supplying themselves as well and then paying for their own passage. But yeah, it's an expensive endeavor and investors in England don't see any return on that, which is why some of them do begin to default on their payments because they think maybe the company's swindling them out of the money because they can't imagine where it's going. And their response is, this is going to be more costly than we imagined. And actually, we're going to need to carry on investing before we see any returns. And that might take some time. You know, there are no quick wins here. They don't find gold. They aren't successful producing any desirable commodities immediately. That happens several years down the line. So at this point, it's this kind of black hole that they are pouring this capital into and it is not offering any returns to the investors. So it's clear the Virginia company needs more money. And you mentioned earlier that one of the pools of people in England who answer the Virginia company's call for further investment was women. And I think that's one of the best and curious finds of your book, The Virginia Venture, is that women come to the aid of the Virginia Company. So would you tell us more about the women who decided to invest in the Virginia Company and what their motivations were for investing in this work of colonization? So it's a relatively small group of women who are named as shareholders. So in 1609, there are a couple of women who invest who are both from merchant backgrounds One of those women you know quite a lot about, she was a woman called Catherine Huberblock, who was from a Dutch merchant family. She's widowed twice over and she becomes very rich and she has a background as an independent merchant. It's women like that that the company can appeal to because they have money to spare. They are interested in these new innovative schemes that might mean an influx of new goods into the marketplace. But for women like that, as well as some of the noble women who invest a bit later, and some of these noble women do already have connections to the company. But what I found, which was really interesting, was that a lot of these women were related to each other as well. You know, I think one of the things that was a motivation or an influence, if you like, was that people are doing this because other members of their family are doing it and their friends are doing it. And they're kind of deciding that it is a shared endeavor that they should all be investing in. And I think for these women, of course, there is a hope or an expectation that they will see some kind of financial benefit from this. 
but it's something that also allows them to establish themselves as more respectable members of their community. And this is not something that's entirely new. Women in this period do lend money and they do invest as a way to become these more influential economic actors in their communities. And I think that they're using the Virginia Company in a similar sort of way. They're making their mark in this realm that from the outside does seem to be typically very macho and male and militaristic. But these women can do something different. They can lend it civility and respectability that I think men at court cannot achieve. And they can leverage influence in other ways as well through their own family networks. And I think one thing that was interesting for me looking at the records is that it's clear that women are often the key to men's investment. Women's marriage portions are sometimes being used by their husbands to invest in colonial ventures. And this is not unique to Virginia. You know, it happens later in places like Barbados as well. But upon marriage, some men suddenly come into this small fortune and they're using women's capital in this way. And equally, when husbands, fathers, brothers, sons die, they are deciding to leave their shares in their companies to their female relatives. Because clearly they see it as something that might offer them some financial security if it does end up being extremely successful. I imagine that women's motivations in many ways were similar to men's. I'm not sure how much they differed. Another woman that I have studied, a woman named Rebecca Romney, was a very influential woman in the London Protestant community. And she decides to lend the company money at precisely the same moment that the company is in conversation with the separatists in Leiden about providing safe harbour for them in the colony. And for me, that was just really intriguing to think that perhaps she was lending money to the company at this time because there was hardship and actually they used that money to further fortify Jamestown. But I did wonder, was she motivated to do it at that particular moment and kind of give them their help because of what she knew it was doing politically to help these Protestant separatists. So often we're kind of reading between the lines a little bit with these sources because what we know about these women is often fairly scant. But there are scraps like that of evidence in the Virginia Company's archive that I think are potentially quite revealing about what it was that garnered their interest. One of the things that I really wanted to do in the book is take this beyond just the traditional list of shareholders, which is often what people are focused on but instead look at the women who lent the company money or provided charitable donations, because that is still an investment of a kind. And I think it's important and it's certainly important to the company at points in time when it needs all the help that it can get. And women, sometimes the people who are stepping in and willing to provide that financial assistance. Misha, this is just really fantastic research. And I wonder why you think it has taken so long to uncover the fact that women were investors and sometimes significant investors in the Virginia Company and in England's initial colonization plans. And I ask this because when we talk about colonization, it's really a very male-dominated story. Men went out to settle the colony, men did all the work to create the colony, and men provided the finances needed to create and sustain the colony. And yet, we've just found out that women also did a lot of this work to create and establish new colonial settlements. If you look at the cold figures, you cannot overstate women's involvement compared to the numbers of men that invested. There are only 12 women who are named as shareholders. While there are greater numbers of women who, like I said, donate money or lend it money or inherit shares and in that way become shareholders, it's still a minority. But I think what's interesting about looking at women is that it can allow us to understand new things about the company and new things about the role of women in colonial projects more generally in this period that, you know, we haven't maybe appreciated or understood before. The example of a woman like Cecily West, who was married to Thomas West, Lord Delaware, the fact that she later petitions Charles I and says, I need help, I need a pension because I gave all my money to my husband and he invested it in Virginia. It just makes me think there could be more examples like that and we might never know about them because the records just may have not survived. But I think it is worth uncovering some of these stories 
like you say, to show that this project was being influenced by women and it was being influenced by gendered ideas, not just in terms of we need to send more women to the colony and women will be crucial to the colony because they will raise our children and teach them to speak English and keep our English customs going, but also that they see women as important as potential investors. There was one funny example I came across when I was doing research, actually in the New York Public Library, they have some archives there relating to Virginia investors. And in the 1630s, there's a colonist who is trying to get his plantation off the ground again. And when he's trying to persuade some of his male friends to invest, he says, you know, I already have certain gentlewomen who have invested, but they would like their names to stay secret. And I always thought that was quite funny because it may well be that he had found these gentlewomen who wanted to invest and didn't want to be credited. But I wondered, did he think that that would be more persuasive for these men if they think that gentlewomen have invested? Because there's a certain credibility there, perhaps. I'm sure other people will come along and hopefully they might have other ideas. But I think it's something that we need to do more research into and perhaps in other colonial spheres as well. You also mentioned earlier that One of the other ways that the Virginia Company expanded its pools of potential investors was that it encouraged more people to participate by running lotteries. Would you tell us about these lotteries and the types of people who would have participated in them and therefore supported the Virginia Company? Yeah, so the company is granted permission in 1612 to start holding these lotteries as a way to generate capital for the colonial venture. It first starts off holding these lotteries in London. They have a few different sites that they use. And we know that these spaces are built from the ground up, these so-called lottery houses, and they're decorated. And there are accounts of people in the company going around to inspect them and see how the work is coming along. But the first lotteries in London are not successful. They have to keep pushing back the dates because enough people are not buying the tickets. And they think that maybe This is because it's a little bit too expensive for most ordinary people that live in the city. So a few years later, they start rolling out these lotteries in other cities instead. And they do a couple of things. They reduce the price of the ticket. So you can now buy a ticket for 12 pence or one shilling, which is fairly affordable for most people. And they also make the drawing of the lots more immediate. So beforehand, you bought your ticket and you had to wait around for a few days before you found out whether or not you'd won anything. This time round, they take the lotteries to towns around England. So everywhere from Manchester in the northwest, all the way down to places like Bristol and Gloucester in the southwest of the country. And they time them to coincide with different events and festivities. So when the lottery goes to Chester, for example, it coincides with the city's midsummer celebrations. So it's a time of the year when people are already flooding into the city for trade and entertainment. And by having the lottery there at that time, they hope that they can exploit this captive audience. And this model, this new model of these lotteries that travel around are much more successful. And we know from court records of incidents when things go wrong at the lotteries that People of, you know, much lower social class, the labouring poor, were buying tickets. And one way that they were doing this was by spreading the cost of ticket amongst themselves. So very much like how people who bought shares in the company might do that. So if a shilling for a ticket was too much, they maybe chipped in, you know, one pence each. And there's one account in Wells, which is a town in the southwest of England of the people taking their winnings to the pub after and buying beer and cake. So it just gives you a sense of the way that people who didn't have very much were able to, in their own way, invest in the colonial project. And I think it's significant because it generates a huge amount of money for the company, around £29,000, which was a significant amount of money. But I think it's also interesting when we're thinking about How did ordinary people contribute to this project and how did they become aware of it as well? You know, if they hadn't already heard about it in church through a sermon or heard a ballad about the new world, maybe they first encountered it because one of the lotteries came to their town or village. And for me, that's just a really sort of intriguing idea. Yeah, I think we have a sense that this company venture, this Virginia company venture, was really a national venture where Everyday men and women, people like us, 
could participate in some way to support England's colonial hopes and dreams. Yeah, I think for me, this way of thinking about the colonial project really stems from expanding what we understand to be that participation. And I think there are very proactive ways that people are involved, whether that's as company shareholders or the people who actually migrate and become colonists. But I think understanding that participation in the colonial project to also include people who do it in maybe more fleeting or passive ways. So buying a ticket for the lottery, for example, you know, money which was put to very real use by the company to send settlers to fortify and to expand the colonial project. But I also think about these fleeting examples of the women, for example, who provided lodging and food and washed the clothes of colonists in the weeks and days leading up to their departures and supplied foodstuffs for the ships. And I think through that lens, we get a sense this requires the buy-in and the support of a much broader public. And I think some people would think, you know, that's not significant. It's not important. You know, how much did they understand about what they were doing? But I think it almost doesn't matter how much they bought into it personally. The fact is that they helped to make it possible. And without their help and their investment in the various different ways that that happened, you know, the project would not have been successful and the English would not have succeeded in establishing a colony in North America. And I think this is important for how people in Britain today understand its colonial past because we have tended to think that this is something that a very elite group of men were involved with and actually other people were not aware, they were not interested, they didn't participate. But I think it kind of forces us to reckon with the fact that this was something that was made possible by ordinary people as well. And how does that change the ways that we think about our colonial past and its legacies for us today? That's what I'm sort of really interested in. It's like you're reading my mind, Misha, because I was just thinking, I wonder how knowing about the participation of this really broad cross-section of the English population in the colonial program changes how we understand colonization today. So As you've been thinking about this, too, I wonder if you would tell us about your thoughts on how this more widespread story of participation in English colonization and in English imperialism impacts our views of English history and England's legacy of colonization. I think something that I'm probably bringing to this research is my point of view as a British scholar in Britain. So I sometimes think that my reading of this evidence and my sort of understanding of this history will differ from people in the United States who have grown up with the history of Jamestown and people who live its impacts and its legacies in very different ways to people in Britain. As an example, my own kind of personal connection with this history is that I didn't know anything about it until the final year of my undergraduate degree had no understanding really of English colonisation in Virginia and it took me by surprise and that was really what made me want to study this history more because generally I think a lot of people in Britain are very unfamiliar with it. And initially the reason that I started looking at the role of women and the way that the labouring classes were involved in this project was more about my own kind of personal interest in wanting to expand the people that I was researching. I thought, you know, I'm kind of getting a bit bored of reading about these members of parliament and company directors. I want to hear about other people. But I think then it struck me that there was something deeper and more interesting about their involvement, which is how Britain does understand its colonial past. And I think sometimes it conflicts with feminist history, it conflicts with working class history, you know, people that sometimes we've seen as being victims in these narratives of empire as well. And actually, I think what this showed was that these were people who sometimes were pushing back and were resisting the colonial project. So poorer people who did not want to be transported to Virginia because they couldn't find a job in England. But actually, it was interesting that these are people who were upholding it and supporting it just as much as the elite men in the city of London are. And I think it's forced me to look at sources, historical sources in different ways. I started to see imperial history everywhere in English archives. But even things like sort of towards the end when I was completing this book, I made a visit to a local church in London where there's a memorial to Catherine Huberbock, who was the woman that I mentioned who invested in the company in 1609. And her memorial survives, which is quite remarkable for it to have survived hundreds of years. 
And I was really interested in her as a woman and someone who was innovative and someone who was clearly independent. But I thought, you know, there's a colonial legacy entangled with this woman and her history and this memorial as well. And what I think is that until we start to surface this history a bit more and to kind of wrap our heads around it and for people to have a greater understanding of it, we can't actually understand our country. And that's in a very kind of physical sense, like these monuments and memorials that we have to different people. But I think we can't understand the debates that are ongoing today about reparative justice and decolonization if we don't actually have all the facts. And the facts are that this wasn't just a minor interest confined to a few people. This was something that actually a whole nation was invested in as well. And I think showing that it is more complex than just good and bad. There were kind of complicated ways that people were involved in this as well. And I just think it's something that we ought to know more about. And hopefully my book can make a small contribution to that understanding. And on that note, we should move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Misha, in your opinion, what might have happened if the English crown had found a way to finance its colonization in North America and the Caribbean on its own? How might the trajectory and success of the colony of Virginia have been different if the Virginia Company had never existed? I think it would have looked very different. Under James I, I think if he had had the money to finance this, I think that what would have developed would have been something more akin to a trading post. I don't think there would have been as much emphasis on settling families and creating permanent communities, these urban settlements with various different industries. I wonder whether it would have been much more focused on male settlers, fortification, militaristic, which is how it was in the beginning. But I think it grew and developed into something else because of the influence of Virginia Company investors. And I think one really good example of that is the creation of the General Assembly in 1618. This House of Assembly gave colonists a hand in governing themselves. And this actually was something that James did not appreciate. And a few years later, when the company was dissolved, he says that he doesn't want to see a company managing colonization again. He doesn't appreciate the political sort of character that colonization had begun to have. Members of the Virginia Company talk about the creation of a new commonwealth. And that term commonwealth has obviously stayed part of the Virginia legacy to this day. But that was a word that had both the meaning of a new state or a polity, but it also had Republican undertones. And I think it's an ongoing debate for scholars. How much did some of these people involved in the company think that they were creating this new kind of Republican state far away from the English crown? And I think we'll probably never agree on that. But I think the direction that it went in, that actually there was much more of a political emphasis on the way that the colony would develop is something that I just don't think would have happened under the direction of the crown. And I think also under the direction of the crown, I don't think we would have seen this expansive participation of people across England like we were just talking to. I think it's a project that would have stayed much more closely entangled with the court. I don't think we would have found examples of people as far flung as Manchester and Bristol getting involved as well. Well, we know that the Virginia Company was just one company of colonization. Of course, after the Virginia Company, there would be the Massachusetts Bay Company and others. So, Misha, is your next research project about these companies or are you researching something completely new? I'm moving away from companies. So the past few years, I've been researching the role of women in colonization in Barbados. And I think that was probably a natural progression for me in some ways. You know, I just find the role of women in English colonization fascinating. And again, I'm interested in the role of women in colonization in Barbados itself, but also what women in England do to uphold colonization in Barbados, including plantation slavery, women as absentee slave owners. And I think this will be research that will help us to better understand 
the British involvement in colonisation in this later period and how slavery develops and how that then develops in England as well and looking at that through the lens of women and their participation and connections. What is the best way for us to contact you if we have more questions about the Virginia Company and England's early program of colonisation? Yeah, so people can find me on Twitter at Misha Ewan. And I also have a website, which is MishaEwan.com. So my email address is on there. And I'm always happy to hear from people if they have questions or want to discuss this further. And they can find out there about my book, but also some other articles that I've written about colonization, including the role of women in the East India Company and Newfoundland as well. So yeah, go and take a look. Misha Ewan, thank you so much for joining us and for taking us behind the scenes of the Virginia Company and for showing us just how widespread support was among English people for England's colonization plans in North America. Thank you so much. It's been great. Misha's comment about how people in England don't have a good understanding of their colonial past really took me by surprise. This is a history that contributed a great deal to the events of early America and to the founding of the United States. So I'll be honest, I had to take a moment to let that information sink in. And now that I have, I suppose this lack of knowledge is similar to how we Americans don't learn enough about topics in our early American past, which is, of course, why we enjoy this podcast. Every time we get together, we have a chance to go deeper into early American history and explore different topics that we knew little about. And this was truly the case with our conversation with Misha. Before Misha's study, scholars knew very little about the widespread involvement of people from all over England and from every English social and economic level to support England's early programs to establish colonies in North America. And as we just discovered, people participated in carrying off these plans in different ways. When it came to the direct support of the Virginia Company, some people invested and became shareholders. Some people bought shares for themselves, and others purchased partial shares when they pulled their money together to buy a share with a group of friends or family. Other English men and women didn't buy shares in the Virginia Company. Instead, they purchased one of the company's lottery tickets. And still other English people didn't directly support the company, but directly supported its colonists by taking care of their food, lodging, and supply needs before they departed for the Virginia colony. As Misha related, when we look at the history of Jamestown and the history of Virginia, we can see that lots of elite and everyday English people supported the idea that England should create and establish colonies in the Americas. They believed it was in their nation's interest to have a colony that could enrich their country with natural resources, new markets for English goods, and perhaps, just perhaps, precious metals. After all, the Spanish were finding lots of gold in Mexico, so why not the English? It is important to remember that while we have just explored colonization from the English point of view, a story which looks to be filled with optimism and opportunity, colonization and colonialism did not and does not look like an optimistic topic to everyone. And we've heard this on the podcast. European colonial schemes meant violence, danger, and exploitation to many different Americans and African peoples. So when we look at the history of colonization, and really all histories, we need to consider the many points of view that exist and existed. It's only when we do this work when we read our history books, watch our documentaries, and comb through the research that we may be doing in libraries, that we can develop true understandings of what it was like to live in and experience early America. You'll find more information about Misha, her book, The Virginia Venture, plus notes, links, and a transcript for everything we talked about today, all on the show notes page. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash 355. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you enjoy Ben Franklin's World, why not adopt a listener this month and tell your friends and family about the show? Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Joseph Edelman, Holly White, Ian Tona, and Taylor Fisher. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, what other European colonial companies or colonization schemes would you like to explore? Tell me, Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios.